Hello, everyone. My name is Aysa Mohammed. I'm from the high performance computing team at NMSU. And today I'm going to give a, a general overview of MPI parallelization. Here is the outline of my talk. I'm going to give a brief background of MPI, but more important, I'm going to dive into a few details of a different MPI communication methods discuss how they work, the advantage and disadvantages um, of each uh, method. Then finally, I'm going to discuss some good example that implement those communication methods and demonstrate to you how to run MPI program on discovery. So let's get it started and we'll come to um, MPI parallelization workshop. Message passing interface is a standardized mode of exchanging messages between multiple processes in a distributed systems. It's a high level network APIs that abstracts away the underlying network and makes it easier for us to write parallel application for distributed memory systems. We use MPI in a message passing, uh, sorry, we use MPI in a high performance computing scenarios when we have big job that doesn't fit in one server. So what we do is we partition it into smaller subtasks and spread them out across the network to multiple nodes. Then get those nodes work together in order to solve the big problem. That is said with MPI module, someone can write MPI parallel application that when it runs, it creates several processes in which each process run on a different node of cluster and exchange it is local data with the other processes across the network in order to cooperate in a solving big a problem. Because in PI, describes the behavior of a compatible message passing library and not it is underlying details. There is no one unique code base that implement the specification of uh, MPI library. In fact, we have several, um, uh, several um, MPI distributions among them uh, the message passing interface Chameleon, also called MPH, Open Message Passing Interface, also called Open MPI, Intel MPI Library, and MVAPH. Okay. Um, the difference between those MPI distributions is that some of them are open source while the other are not. Some of them support wide variety of hardware while the other supports specific hardware, and some of them can achieve superior performs compared to the other, possibly because uh, they take advantage of uh, some hardware, some network topologies, or some communication uh, protocols. However, in this presentation, we will focus on OpenMPI because it's recommended for discovery. Uh, probably some of you familiar with or heard of um, uh, uh, OpenMP uh, library. And just to make sure that you don't confuse it with MPI, I want to spend uh, some time here in this slides to explain the differences between OpenMP and MPI. MPI and OpenMP are different, totally different from each other. MPI is a process-based parallelism. It, someone can use it to write uh, parallel application for distributed memory systems in which each process um, runs in, 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 in independently uh, in a different node of cluster has its own memory address space and exchange it is local data with the other processes across the network uh, by passing messages. 
And now here, I wanna say that whenever I use, use the word messages, it can also mean data, okay? It, it's not only message, it, it could be a uh, array of numbers or it could be um, a list of strings or, or any type of data. Um, 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 so so when, when I use the word message, I also mean data as well. Okay, now let's go back to uh, uh, the comparison between MPI and OpenMP. Okay, so as I said, um, MPI is a, is a, a process-based parallelism someone can use to write parallel application for uh, distributed memory systems. On the other hand, OpenMP is a thread-based parallelism. Someone can use it to write parallel application for shared um, memory uh, systems. When a parallel code section in a program gets executed and the, th and the threads get created, all the threads uh, with the OpenMP model would share the same memory address space. That said, there is no notion of message uh, passing with uh, between those threads with OpenMP because all the threads access uh, the same um, uh, memory uh, locations. Another major difference between MPI and OpenMP is um, that the process uh, creation overhead with MPI is a, a, a occurs one time when when the processes are created, but the Thread creation overhead with OpenMP, of course, it depends on how you write your program and how many times uh, you, um, uh, uh, you, 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 how many times you get the uh, parallel code section um, uh, executed, but it occurs multiple of times and that's uh, 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 add uh, extra overhead, okay? Uh, uh, and may downgrade uh, compared to the MPI downgrade um, uh, the utilization um, of, uh, of the processes. All right. Okay, now let's discuss the outline or the basic outline of any MPI uh, program. Every MPI program needs at least one master process and one or similar, several worker processes. The master process is responsible for partitioning a big task into a smaller subtask and fairly distribute those subtasks across the network to, um, uh, to, to, to the worker processes. The worker process on the other hand is responsible for receiving the task assigned to it by the master process, um, uh, work on its task and send the result of its work back to the master process, which collect the work of all the processes and combine the solution together if it's necessary. And finally, uh, terminate the parallel job uh, if it completes. In order to do that, we need to initialize the MPI environment um, for uh, all the processes, okay, the MPI processes. So we need to write that code. We need also to write the code that helps the uh, MPI processes to find the total number of the processes within uh, their group, okay? We also uh, call, uh, call it uh, a communicator, okay? A group or communicator, all right. And also help the MPI uh, gain its rank within the group. And here rank means uh, a, a unique identification uh, number that is used to identify uh, each a process within the group, okay? And that number is within the range of zero to n minus one, where n here mean the total number of the processes in the same uh, group. We also need the code um, that help the processes to exchange uh, data among uh, themselves, okay? Uh, and here in particular, we mean uh, the MPI send, MPI receive uh, routines. And finally, we need the code um, that um, help the master process or the other processes to uh, terminate uh, themselves and terminate the parallel job if it's complete. And here we mean the MPI finalize. 
Good. Now, in order for two processes to exchange data, okay, um, um, both the processes need to, need to agree on the type of data that would be sent or received, okay? MPI provides um, several elementary data types um, that is shown here in this table along with the cor their corresponding uh, C data types, okay? Uh, basically, those data types um, can be used to send uh, textual messages or uh, numerical uh, messages. Now, we, we mentioned earlier that uh, MPI provides uh, some communication methods, and we are going to discuss those uh, communication methods. But you should know that uh, those communication methods can be um, blocking communication or non-blocking communication. So um, I would like to discuss with you what I mean by blocking communication and non-blocking communication before we uh, list those uh, communication methods. With a blocking communication, the execution of a process gets suspended once the function call to send or receive routine is made and it has to wait until the function call returns. And once the function call returns, then the process can continue its execution and be able to reuse uh, the message uh, buffer. Good. Now, there are some scenarios where the function call returns, okay? For the sentence process, the function call returns when the content of the message buffer when, and, and here, when we say the message buffer, we mean the sending buffer or, um, or uh, uh, if we are talking from the perspective of the sending process, and we mean the uh, receiving buffer if we are talking from the perspective of the receiving a process, okay? But let's just use the, the term um, uh, message buffer, okay? So for the sending process, the, the function core returns once the message buffer content is safely copied out to either its destination or to another extra system buffer. Okay, all right. Once the once once the content of that buffer is copied out, then it is safe um, for the process to reuse the message buffer, and hence. Um, it can continue its execution, okay? For the receiving process, the function call returns when the message being sent by the uh, sending a process is completely received by the receiving a process. As you can see here, the blocking communication is safe because it prevents, um, it prevents the uh, message buffer content from uh, uh, being modified before the message um, is sent to its destination or copied out uh, to another safe location like um, uh, like the temporal uh, uh, this uh, the temporal system uh, buffer, right? However, if such a protection is not needed until later uh, point in the program, then we better use non blocking uh, communication in order to increase the process utilization okay if the if the uh, uh, if the process if the process wouldn't modify uh, the message buffer content uh, in the case if the message has not been yet sent to its destination then then why we should block its execution why not let the um, let the sending process or the receiving a process to continue and do some uh, useful work as long as it doesn't modify the message uh, buffer uh, content. All right. Now, with non blocking send and receive, uh, the function call returns immediately um, once the um, once uh, the the call to to that routine is made, the send or the receive uh, routine, because the job of the process here is just to notify the MPI uh, system by ongoing uh, or oncoming message. That's it, okay? It, it, it's not its job to make sure that the content of the um, message buffer 
is safely copied out either to its destination or um, or uh, to uh, to another um, extra system uh, buffer. Excuse me. All right. Uh, all all what the that process needs to do is uh, to just notify uh, the MPI system by ongoing and incoming um, messages and let the system, the MPI system decides uh, when and how to send uh, the message to its uh, destination. However, it is the responsibility of the programmer to make sure that the content of the message buffer wouldn't modify until that happened, until the, its content sent by the MPI system to uh, its uh, destination. For that, MPI provides uh, two routines. Uh, the first one called MPI wait, um, and it is a plug-in communication routine where, where it does, uh, the function call does a return until the specified uh, operation. Uh, is completed. And the second one is the MPI test, um, and it is non blocking communication routine uh, in, in which it returns immediately um, once the call to that routine is made, and it returns with a, a Boolean flag true if the message has been successfully delivered or uh, sent to its destination, otherwise uh, it returns uh, false. Now, we can discuss um, the different um, uh, MPI communication methods, but I would like you to know that for this workshop, I would only focus on two of them, uh, MPI point-to-point -point communication and collective uh, communication. Now, let's just start with uh, MPI point-to-point uh, communication. MPI point-to-point -point communication involves the transfer of message from one process to another particular process in the same uh, group, all right? It requires both processes, the sending process and the receiving process, to uh, be aware or to know um, the, the source or the uh, destination of the message, the um, uh, identification tag associated with the message and the type and the size of the message that would be sent or received. Excuse me. Okay. MPI provides um, different type or different mode of point to point send communication. Okay. Let's call it point to point send modes. Okay. Um, they are listed here in this table, namely uh, synchronous um, send mode, buffer send mode, ready send mode, and standard send mode, okay? Those modes can be blocking communication or non-blocking uh, communication, okay? For example, here, let me use one example here. Synchronous send mode can be blocking communication by using the MPI S send routine, where the capital S here stands for synchronous or can be non-blocking communication using um, the synchronous non-blocking routine MPI I S send, S send, where I here, the uppercase I here uh, refers to uh, immediate results, okay? Uh, sorry, immediate return. All right, now let's discuss those different point-to-point -point send modes one by one, okay? Let's start with the synchronous send. Synchronous send here requires a handshake between the two processes, the sending process and the receiving process in order for the sending process to send the data to its uh, destination. In other words, um, with the synchronous send, the sending process um, needs to send the uh, a ready to send signal to the receiving process, which in return replies, if it's ready to receive, of course, replies with a ready to receive uh, signal. Once the sending process receive a ready to receive signals, as you can see here, okay? So it's in the 
um, are ready to send signal to the receiving process. This is our sending process, and this is our receiving process. Okay, so it sends first, sends ready to sig ready to send signal to the receiving process, which in return replies with ready to receive uh, uh, signal. Okay, once the sending process receives the ready to receive signal that is posted by the receiving process, it starts or initiate um, um, the, the, the sending process of the actual message. Now it's going to send the message to its destination here. All right, good. Again, as we explained here, okay, each one of those communication modes uh, can be uh, non-plucking uh, non communication or plucking communication. That is said, synchronous send can be Blocking communication or non blocking communication. Blocking communication using the routine MBI S send or non blocking communication using the routine uh, MBI I S send. Now let's discuss the difference uh, between um, a, a synchronous blocking send mode and synchronous non blocking send mode. With synchronous blocking send mode, okay, the process sees execution gets suspended until the handshake is made and the message is completely de delivered from its source to its uh, destination. When that is made successfully, then the function called returns and now um, it's okay for the uh, sending process and the receiving process to continue its execution and reuse uh, their um, uh, their uh, message buffers, okay, uh, for another work. Good. However, with the synchronous non block send mode or send routine, we, we, we are talking in particular here about the MPI ISS send, the function call returns immediately, okay, once the call to the MBI as ISS sent is made, okay? Because uh, the job of the process is just to notify the uh, MBI system of ongoing or incoming uh, message, okay? Uh, it is not its job to ensure that the content of the message buffer um, is safely delivered to its destination, okay? And because of that, it is the responsibility of the programmer to make sure that the message buffer, when we use the synchronous non block and send mode, that the message buffer content wouldn't get modified before the actual message get delivered to its destination, okay? Now it is up to the MPI system to decide when it to send it. However, until the MPI system decide to send it, the programmer, must ensure that the, the, the message buffer doesn't get uh, modified, okay? We, we, don't, we don't change the, its contents, okay? We don't post any uh, new messages, okay? We wanna make sure that message get delivered successfully to its destination, okay? Um, the programmer can use the MPI wait routine and the MPI or the MPI test routine uh, for that. Excuse me. Okay. Um, the second point to point send mode in our list is the buffer send. It requires the use of extra system buffer called user supply buffer, okay? As shown here in this figure, okay? So this is our sending um, uh, process, okay? It has two buffers, the message buffer and the user uh, supplied buffer. Okay, this is our extra buffer, the user uh, supplied buffer. Now, if the ready to receive signal has been already posted in the MPI system by the receiving process before the buffer send routine is called, then calling the buffer send routine will result in sending the content of the message buffer directly to its destination here, 
okay, which is uh, the uh, receiving a process. Otherwise, and what we mean here is if the mess, if the ready to receive signal has not been yet posted on uh, the MPI system, then the content of the message buffer has to be safely copied out to the user supply buffer and let the MPI system decide when and how to send it uh, to, um, to its destination here, okay? Uh, however, uh, there are uh, two different uh, communications method, me communication methods here. Um, um, again, as, as we mentioned earlier, the buffer send mode can be uh, blocking communication or non uh, plugging communication, okay? Uh, um, um, using buffer, buffered uh, plugging communication, the function called returns once the content of the message buffer is safely copied either to the, it is destination, if the ready to receive signal has been already posted by the receiving process on the MPI system or to the temporal buffer user supply uh, buffer if otherwise, okay? Once the copy, once the content of the message buffer is copied to the user supply buffer, the function core returns and hence the, um, the, the, the sending process now can uh, continue its execution, do any other uh, useful work as long as it doesn't change the content of the user supply buffer until the MPI system sent its content to its destination. Good. Now, we said that we also have the buffer and non-blocking send mode, okay? And with buffered non-blocking uh, send mode, the function called returns immediately once the um, IB send routine is made. So for for the blocking, for the buffered blocking send mode, we will use the MPIB send routine. For the non, for the buffered non-blocking send mode, we will use the MBI IB send routine. Okay, good. Now, uh, the function return core returns with the uh, MPI IB send IB send routine. It returns immediately and hence the process uh, can continue its execution, okay? It returns immediately even before the content of the buffer, uh, message buffer is copied either to its destination or to the user uh, supply uh, buffer, okay? And because of that, it is the responsibility of the programmer to make sure that, all right, okay, the, the process can continue its execution, that is fine, okay, as long as it doesn't change the content of the message buffer, okay? So it cannot reuse it. It can do any other work, but it cannot uh, reuse um, uh, the message buffer until it is content is copied here or to the user supply buffer or it's sent to its destination. Good. All right, now to implement buffer send mode, it is the responsibility of the programmer to create, define the user supply buffer in its program, okay? Using the MPI buffer attach, okay? And attach it to the MPI system and use it to temporarily copy the content of the message buffer if the ready to receive signal has not been already posted on the MPI system by the receiving process. If that is the case, then yes, we need, we need to use um, that, um, that temporal uh, system buffer, the user supply buffer, okay? So we need to create it anyway in our program, okay? Uh, when you write your program, you need to create, you need to put the code that create, that's one. Um, no matter if you're gonna use it or not gonna use it, okay? Because it is the MPI system to decide uh, to use it or not to use it, okay? And it depends on if the ready to receive signal has been posted or not posted. All right, now we um, MPI provide those two routines, the MPI buffer attach uh, to define um, that, um, excuse me, the user supply buffer and the MPI buffer deattach to deattach it when you're done 
with it, okay? And they attach it from uh, the MPI system, good. And here is the uh, plug-in routine and non plug routine of the buffer send uh, mode, good. Now, another thing that as programmer, you need to be aware of it is that you have you, it's your responsibility to ensure that the size of the temporal buffer, the user supply buffer you create in your program, it's large enough, okay, to hold or to store, temporally store um, uh, uh, any message your program want to send to its destination, okay? If the size of the um, user supply buffer you create in your program is a smaller than the size of the message your program want to send, then an error in the program would occur and that may even result in terminating uh, your program. So you need to be aware of that, okay? You need to create um, uh, a user supply buffer in your program that, that is large enough to hold any message um, your um, MPI program uh, want to pass, okay? Or want to send, um, um, in, 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 when it runs. All right, good. The third one in our list of the point-to-point -point, uh, send mode is uh, the ready send, okay? Um, all right, um, this type of uh, send mode doesn't require handshake like synchronous uh, send mode. It doesn't require extra buffer like uh, buffer uh, buffered uh, send mode. It assumes that the ready to receive signal has been already posted by the receiving process. And because of that, it starts initiating the process of transferring the message from the source to its destination, uh, from the sending a process to uh, the receiving process. Even before, for example, um, uh, even, bef uh, even before the actual um, um, ready to receive signal is posted uh, on the MPI system, okay? So it, it is started, but at some point here, some point here, okay, um, the, the receiving process must post the message or otherwise, otherwise is that the sending process get terminated, okay? And error is generated and detected on the receiving uh, process side. But if the in the middle of sending uh, the data to its destination, the receiving process posted the ready to receive signal, in the MBI system, then it is safe to continue um, 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 transferring the data to its destination. So it get delivered by the receiving a process. Good. Okay, so um, as a programmer, you, you, you need to ensure when you write your program, you need to make sure that it is always the case that the receiving process will post um, the ready to receive signal in the MPI system if you use the ready send mode, okay? If otherwise, okay, if you're not sure that it's always the case that the receiving, um, that the receive signal um, uh, will be posted, okay, then you better not to use uh, the ready send, okay, because uh, it will downgrade uh, your process utilization, okay. Uh, every time you initiate um, uh, send a process, uh, you, you, you get it terminated, okay, uh, because uh, at some point the uh, ready to receive um, um, a signal has not been yet posted, okay. Um, so, so that is, that is not good. It's downgrade the uh, the, your your process utilization. So if you're gonna use it, uh, you gotta make sure that um, uh, it is always the case when once the ready send mode is used, it's always the case that the 
um, receiving a process with both the uh, ready to receive signal and the um, in the open MP uh, in the in the MPI system. All right. The last one in our list is the standard send mode, and it follow a compromise a position in which if the message is short, it uses it applies the buffer send mode, but if the message is large, it applies the synchronous send mode. All right, so it's up to the MPI system uh, to decide which one it use, uh, depends on the size uh, of um, the message that would be sent and received. Okay, now let's compare, or actually let's, list the advantages and the disadvantages of, uh, advantages of each one of those um, uh, point to point send mode, okay? So let's start with the synchronous send mode. So the advantage of synchronous send mode, it is the safest among all of the point to point uh, send mode uh, routines that we just uh, discussed. And why is that? Because if you use synchronous plug-in, um, synchronous plug-in send mode, then your, 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 then then the message buffer wouldn't be modified, okay, um, uh, before its content safely copied out either to its destination, actually to its destination, okay. It doesn't use buffer, okay, okay. So so um, uh, so so that prevents. Uh, your sending process uh, or receiving a process from copying, uh, from modifying their uh, message buffer, okay? Uh, so it is the safest, okay? You, you guarantee that the message will be delivered correctly and completely, okay? And that is good. And also it doesn't use extra buffer for that, okay? Uh, uh, unlike uh, buffered, um, uh, buffered send mode. The only disadvantage that I can see here is the synchronous overhead okay that occurs when the sending process and the receiving a process execution gets to block until the handshake is made and the message is completely delivered from its source to its uh, destination okay that may um, downgrade your process uh, utilization and you shouldn't use the synchronous uh, plug in uh, send mode um, if you know for sure that if you if you release the execution of the sending process or the receiving process, they wouldn't do anything has to do uh, with uh, modifying um, the uh, the uh, message buffer before its content gets sent to its destination or received uh, from uh, from the source. All right. With the, the advantage of the buffer sent mode is that it there is no synchronous over here, overhead here, okay? And since, and hence, the, uh, the, the, it decouples the sender from the receiver, okay? Because if the ready to receive signal is not busted in the system, then it can copy the content of the message bus bar to the temporal buffer called user supply buffer, okay? And by doing that, it decoupled the sender from the receiver um, when the function call returns so for the sending process can continue its execution and reuse uh, the mess its message uh, buffer, okay? Good. Also, the buffer size is adjustable, it's up to uh, the programmer, okay, uh, can create a um, uh, buffer with any size. They see it's okay and uh, it is safe to use, okay? The sending and receiving order is irrelevant because as I said, if the receiving process didn't, excuse me, didn't post the ready to receive signal, then uh, the content of the message uh, buffer can uh, just be copied to uh, the temporal buffer, the user supply buffer, and the function core returns, and it decouples the sender from the receiver. So 
descendant um, uh, process can continue its execution and do uh, any uh, other useful work. And that actually will increase uh, its utilization. The only disadvantage that I can see here is um, that using this type of point-to-point -point send mode requires the creation of an extra buffer and maintaining that buffer. And actually that's considered an additional overhead, okay? Now the advantage of the ready send mode is that it, is, it has less overhead because there is no synchronous, um, it, it doesn't require hand check, okay? Between the two processes. So uh, uh, there is no synchronous overhead. It doesn't require the use of extra buffer. So there is no that additional overhead due to the creation and the maintaining uh, of uh, that buffer, okay? Good, but the only disadvantage that I can see here is that the receive must precede the send. What I mean here is that at some point, the ready to receive signal must be posted by the receiving process in the MPI system before, um, at some point, um, um, before, uh, in the middle actually, uh, uh, of, of, of sending the data from its source to its destination. Uh, otherwise, it will, uh, it will um, get interrupted and uh, terminated and error would be generated and detected on the um, uh, receiving process side, okay? The standard mode, the advantage of it, um, since it's a compromised position, so, and it's since used the buffer send mode, and the synchronous mode um, depends on the size of the message that would be sent and received, then it has the advantage of both, the synchronous mode and the buffer mode. And it has the disadvantage of both, okay? The synchronous and the buffer mode. Add to it, um, it is determined by the MPI, okay? Um, um, implementation to, 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 either, uh, to, to decide which one to use. All right, now let's discuss the other MPI communication method, which is called collective communication. It involves the participation of all the processes in the group or the communicator, okay? And again, um, it can also be done as blocking communication or non-blocking communication. Good. MPI provide a list of um, uh, collective communication uh, routines, okay, that someone can use uh, in order to exchange uh, data between um, multiple processes in the same group, okay? Good. The first one in the list is the MPI uh, pairier routine, okay, which synchronize, use it to synchronize all the processes uh, in the group, okay? Someone can use it, um, for example, to ensure, um, for example, the programmer to ensure that a, a specific operation gets executed by all the processes before the processes continue executing other operations, okay? And the way it works is uh, that when a process called the MPI period, its execution gets blocked until all the processes in the group call that routine, okay? Let's use this figure here, figures here to discuss how it works, okay? As you can see here in the first time snap shot here, okay? You can see that the process with the rank zero, process zero, which is the master process, okay? Or the root, also called the root process. You can see that it, is execution got suspended as soon as it calls the MPI period. So it hanged on, on the period here, okay? Waiting for the other processes in the same group to call the same routine, the MPI period. Now, if you look at the second time screenshot, you will see that eventually process one called the routine MPI period. So it joins 
now a process uh, zero, its execution gets suspended and it hanged on the period and both waiting, waiting for the other processes in the group to call the MPI period in order for them to continue execution. That will continually uh, occurs until all the processes in the group call the MPI period routine. So now for them, can they can continue um, uh, executing. And as I said, the programmer can use this routine when they want to um, ensure that a specific operation is executed by all the processes in the group before the processes continue um, to uh, execute any other operations. All right, excuse me. The second collective communication routine in our list is the MPI PCAST, okay? Which is executed um, by all the processes. In the case of the master process, if it calls this routine, the MPI PCAST, then the master process can use it to broadcast the data to all the processes in the group, including itself, as you can see here, okay? Good. What else? Uh, so yes, so the master process can use it to broadcast data to all the processes in the group. The other processes also must call it in order to receive the data sent by the master a process. Good. Okay, now, um, as you can see, um, this is a good scenario where the program can use the MPI period, okay, to ensure that once the master process broadcasts a data using the MPI PCAST, all the processes must be enforced to call that routine, the MPI PCAST, to receive the data sent by, um, by the master process. We could enforce them using the MPI period, okay? Uh, the MPRP period will suspend their execution until uh, all the processes uh, execute uh, the MPI PCAST. Good. So now we have another collective communication routine called MPI scatter in our list. And uh, like the MPI PCAST, MPI scatter is used to send data. The, 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 the master process use it to uh, broadcast or send data to the other processes in, in, in the group. However, unlike, unlike the MPI PCAST, MPI scatter, okay, if, um, um, distribute the data into N segments and send the ith segment to the process with rank ith, okay? So for example, here, process zero, uh, distribute its array into n segments and send the segment zero, which is by chance the value zero, okay? Sing the, uh, send this, uh, the, the, uh, the data in a position zero to the process that has the rank zero and send the data 100 here in the position one to the process that has the rank one and send the data in the position two to the process that has the rank two and so on, okay? Um, where the BCAST, the MPI BCAST actually send the same data, not, not a chunk of the data to a different process. No, it send the same data to all the processes. So for example, if it send this array here, 0, 100, 200, 300, then every process here would receive copy of the same data, okay? All of them, okay? But here with MB scatter, we can see that each one 
receive a unique value, okay? Um, um, where, as I said, it, um, it distributed into segments and send the i segment to, uh, to the process with the rank i, okay? If, if let's assume that the array is uh, larger than the one we see here. And uh, for example, it has eight elements, okay? Let's assume that there is some other elements here, okay? Um, so process zero would send zero to process, to process zero itself, okay? 100 to process one, 200 to process two, and 300 to process three. Then let's say that there is 400 here. So it's going to be sent to process zero, okay? And there is 500, it's going to be sent to process one. And there is uh, 600, so it's going to be sent to process two and so on, okay? So it's okay uh, if the length of the array is larger than the number of the processes, okay? Because um, uh, process zero will know which chunk of data that has to be sent to each uh, um, one of them. Good. Okay, now another one in our list is the MPI gather, okay? Excuse me. Okay. Um, we can use the MPI gather to collect and actually the, uh, um, a process can use it to collect data from all the processes in the group, combine it in array data structure, okay? So collect it and combine it, okay? Good. Process zero or the master process or the rotor process does that, okay? It collects the data from all the processes and, and put it in uh, one array, combine the solution in one array. Now, this is actually a good scenario to show you how MPI parallel programs works, okay? Let's assume that you wanna write a program that sorts large array, okay? Um, now we're talking about MPI program, okay? Now the master process can take that array, partition it into N segments and send each chunk of the array to a different process in which each process work on solving that task and using the gather routine, the process zero, the master process with the collect the result of their work, each process, combine their solution in one array and print it out, for example, to the user, or maybe um, uh, add, it, add it up together in order to tell you, for example, let's say the number of time, um, uh, the frequency of a number in array, for example, okay? All gather, it's another collective communication routine, okay? Um, that a process can use to collect data from all the processes in the group, including itself, combine the data into array, then copy the array and send it to each a process in the group. The last one in our list is all to all routine, okay? In which each a process distribute its data into in segments and send the i segments to the process with the rank i. So that process, the receiving process, is stored into array into position that match the rank of the sending process. Let me explain it to you. Okay. So now let's assume, okay, now we are talking about process zero, okay? Now process zero has an array with four elements. Process zero using all to all would distribute its array into n segments. This is will be 
the first segment, the second segment, the third segment, and the fourth segment. And now start to send each segment to the process that has rank matches the number of the segment. So this is the first segment and it's in the position zero. So the value zero, it's sent to process zero because it has rank zero. This is the second segment in position one, and it sends to the process that has rank one. Because remember, the array start from zero to n minus one, okay, where n is the number of elements in the array, okay? So when we say the first, we mean position zero. When, when we say the second, we mean, we mean position one, okay? Now, the third one, third value, in the position two is sent to the process with the rank that match the position number, which is two, so process two here, okay? Now, each receiving process here, once it's received, the data assigned to it by the master process, in our case here, process zero, it is stored in the position that matches the rank of the sending process. Now the sending process has rank zero. So zero value is sent to process zero because it has rank zero that matches the position of the value zero in the source array. And it is stored in the first position, which is position zero, because the position matches the rank of the sending process. Now let's take process one as example. Okay, the value 100 is sent to process one because it's in the position one and the process one has rank one. Once the process one receive it, it is stored in the first position in its array, which is position zero, because it matches the rank of the sending process. The send process has the rank zero, okay, and so on. All right, now let's discuss MPI programs that apply the communication methods we have just discussed. In order to do that, I'm going to write a program that calculates the frequency of a number in array. I'm going to write that program in a three different versions, namely serial version, MPI version that applies point-to-point -point communication, and another MPI version that applies collective communication for the same purpose. Harris our serial um, uh, program, we need to write code that define array, populate the array with random numbers, and generate a random number. We are going to, um, this is going to be our desired number that we want to calculate its frequency um, in the array. Then we need to write code that passes the number and the array to a function that linearly searches for that number in the array in order to calculate its frequency. And finally, print out the results. We can write this program with MPI module. Here is the MPI program that applies point-to-point -point communication. We need code, we need to write code that initialize the MPI environment for each process, helps each process to find the number of processes in its group and finds its rank within the group. For the master process, we need to write code that defined array, populate it with the random numbers, generate a number, a random number here, 
This is going to be our desired number that we want to calculate its frequency. We also need to write code that helps the master process to partition the array into subtasks and fairly distribute them among the work processes. For that, we are going to use the MBI send routine. This is one of the um, uh, point to point communication modes that we discussed. Okay, here we using the MBI send routine to tell each worker process uh, the size of its portion of the array. And here we are using the MBI send routine to send each process um, um, its portion of the array or its tasks. And finally, here we are using the MBI send routine to send our desired number to each process so they can uh, calculate its frequency within the array, the portion of the array they received. Good. We also need to write code that helps the master process to collect the work results of each process once their job, parallel job is done and print it out on the screen. For the worker processes, we need to write code that helps each process to receive the size of its portion of the array so it can be used to define a temporal array, a puffer, in order for each process to use it to receive um, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the number of elements that it's passed uh, by uh, the master process for that uh, worker process. Here we are, we are using the MBI receive routine um, um, so that for each process um, can receive uh, it is portion of the array or its tasks. Once it is the portion of the array for each process is received, then um, th we need to write code that helps each worker a process to receive our desired number that we want to calculate its frequency. We also need to write code that helps each worker process to linearly search for that number in the array in order to calculate its frequency. And finally, send its work results back to the master process. At the end of the program, we need to write code that terminates the parallel job when, once it is done. We can either reduce the code size of this MPI program by using collective communication Here is our MPI program that uses collective communication. We need to write code that, that, that initialize the MPI environment for each process, helps each a process to find the number of processes in its group and helps each process to find its rank within the group. For the master process, we need to write the code that help the master process to populate array with the random numbers, generates a random number. This is going to be our desired number that we want to calculate its frequency. Then we need to write code that helps the master process to partition array into subtask and fairly distribute them among the worker processes. For that, we are going to use the MPI cast here um, in order for the master process to tell each worker process the size of its portion so that each worker process can include in actually the master process here um, to, um, uh, to define uh, a temporal array uh, with uh, a size that matches the number or the size of its uh, portion of the array. Then we need to write code that helps the master process uh, to uh, send 
um, our desired number that we want to calculate its frequency. Um, and BI cast would also be called by uh, the, uh, the worker processes to, to receive that number. Then we need to write code that helps the master process to, um, uh, to, to send each a process it is task, okay? Um, again, each worker process will use the MPI scatter uh, in order to receive uh, it is portion of the array passed by the master process. We need also to write code that helps each process, worker processes and the master process uh, to uh, linearly search for um, our desired number within the list in order to calculate its frequency. And finally, we need to write code that helps the master process to collect the work results of each uh, process, accumulate them here in one solution and print out the results. At the end of the program, we need the code that terminates the parallel job once it is done. Good, now let's demonstrate how to run MPI program on discovery. We are going to use um, uh, the MPI program that applies point to point communication, uh, particularly the one that uses the MPI send routine, the one I just uh, discussed. In order to run an MPI program on discovery, you need first to tell discovery the number of the processes that you want to you want discovery to create and run. All right. Now, using a slurm, okay, we can write. Um, okay, so um, hold on seconds. Let me. Okay, let me let me launch the patch scripts that we are going to submit to Slurm in order to run our MBI program and discovery. Okay, now, as I said, first you need to tell discovery the number of the processes that want it to create and run along with the resources that want uh, discovery to allocate to each uh, process, okay? Using a Slurm, a process is a task. So for example, here, the dispatch directive in tasks, okay, uh, represent the number of the processes which is for here, the number of processes that we want discovery to create and, uh, and run, okay? Um, uh, along here, the resources that we want discovery to allocate to each process. For example, here, we want discovery to allocate one CPU and 500 megabytes of RAM to each uh, process. We also need to tell discovery our program dependencies in order to successfully uh, run, okay? Um, for example, in order to run our MPI program, we need Discovery to launch the, the open MPI library in our program execution environment. We also need to, um, to tell Discovery to compile our program and create an executable, farm, uh, executable file from it, then to use the slurm command here as run to run our um, uh, executable uh, or our MPI uh, program. All right, we are using here the end flag here to tell uh, discovery the number of the processes we want it to create and run. In case flag in, is not provided, discovery will use the dispatch directive here and tasks to figure out the number of the processes that needs to create a run. For example, here is four. All right, now let me show you. Okay, so we need to write this uh, in a, a patch script. We, 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 we call it job patch script, okay? Because that, 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 that patch script describes uh, our job that we want discovery, uh, that we want submit to uh, discovery in, and, and we want discovery 
to, to, to run, okay? Now, now, let me show you how you can uh, run, um, uh, run our MPI program in Discovery, okay? First, you need to submit that batch script uh, uh, to SLARM, okay? Um, in order uh, for our MPI program uh, to run in Discovery. We will use the command is batch, okay? Then the name of our batch script, okay? All right, to submit it to SLARM so it can run on Discovery. SLARM assign job ID to our, um, uh, to our job. The, the job ID is 1428-151, okay? We will use this number to look for the output of, the, of executing our uh, program, okay? So if we view the current directory, you can see there is an output file, okay, with extension dot out, okay, that, um, uh, that part of its name is the uh, job ID assigned by SLARM to our program. Okay, now it is 1428-151, so it is here, 1428-151. Now let's review the content of that output file, okay, in order to figure out um, and see what happens when our uh, program uh, uh, run on discovery, okay? So I will use the Linux command cat, okay? Now, as you can see here, discovery creates and run four processes from our program, namely process zero, process one, process two, and process three, okay? Process zero is our master process. The other processes are the worker process. You can see here that the master process partition the array into subarrays or into subtasks and send each a process it is portion of the array. For example, here, the master process send this number of elements to the worker process with rank process one, and this number of elements to the worker process with rank two, and this number of elements to the worker process with the rank three. Good. Once each worker process gets its job done, it sends the work results, its work results back to the master process, which collects them combine them in one solution and bring them out to us, okay? Here is um, the master process prints out the results um, uh, of, of the MPI, of running, of executing the MPI program, okay? As you can see here, our random number happened to be 23, okay? So the frequency of the number 23 in our array was, 9,983. All right. Now, I would like to share with you the results of uh, experiments that I have conducted in order to compare the performance of the serial version of the program that calculates the frequency of a number in array and compare it to the performance of the MPI parallel uh, programs uh, uh, version of the, of the same program, okay? All right, now, as you can see here in this graph, okay, um, the X axis here represents the size of the array in each experiment. As you can see, we run four experiments, okay? The Y axis here represents the execution time both program spends in each experiment in order to solve our problem. All right, the blue, the blue line here represents the serial version of our program. The orange line here represents 
the MPI version of our program. And by the way, uh, we use the MPI version that applies point-to-point -point communication, particularly the one that used the MPI SYNT routine or um, the standard SYNT mode. Good. From the graph, we can conclude that when both programs run on a small array size, the serial version of the program outperforms the parallel version, the MPI parallel version of the program. And this most likely because the additional overhead added to the MPI program due to um, uh, the initializing of the MPI environment, managing the communication between the processes and terminating the MPI execution environment. However, as the array size grows, we can see that the execution time of the serial version of the program increases while the execution time of the MPI program decreases compared to the execution time of the serial version of the program. From that, we can conclude that the MPI para program outperforms the serial version of the program when both run in a large data set or large array size. That's it for our workshop. And please, if you need more information about Discovery Cluster, please visit our website, www.hpc.nmsu.edu. And uh, to get more information about our events and activities, uh, please uh, visit uh, or follow the um, the HP uh, the HPC um, team on Twitter and YouTube. Thank you very much.